And so what is happening now is that we start education in such a way that education becomes something, especially in the early stage where retention is so vital. Welcome to Solid Rock Christian Assembly. My name is Hina. Did you know that God has a unique position for men in communities, in families, and churches as leaders? Pastor Garth's message today is rallying all men, and we invite you to join us in the sanctuary. Solid Rock, where comes you? In Joshua chapter 1, we see here, as was read earlier uh, by uh, Yusuf, he read concerning um, the transition between Moses and Joshua. It was a transition from uh, the leadership of Moses to that of his, uh, his mentee. Transition from the mentor to the mentee. Transition from one generation of leadership to another. And um, God has called us in such a time as this to, to really transition and take on a role as it relates to our generation. We can make a difference. We really can. One of the interesting reality as it relates to the church is the, is the vast um, gap between, or the gender gap we would uh, call it. It's a vast gap um, between the man and the woman in terms of uh, attendance in the church. It's a problem that is prevalent within the church itself. The lack of men. And what are some of the reasons why so few men are in the church? According to um, a poll here, it is said, uh, again, it, this is an American poll, but of course we're not far off. It says, in America, 61% of the people who attend church are women, which obviously leaves us with 39 when it comes to uh, the men. This is a, uh, a U.S. congregation uh, a survey. That means on a given Sunday, there are million, the millions of women attending church more than uh, men. They're saying here that as far as reasons, what are the reasons why more females attend church than males? Well, one theory, theory is that the church, the church is teaching. It emphasizes humility, holiness, and introspection as seen by some men as, as weakness and less masculine. And so... Men, they say, are looking for a challenge, something that is bold, something that is more adventurous, dangerous, and aggressive. Another theory is that many churches knowingly and unknowingly create a feminine environment with our things like our decor, our floral arrangement, our pastel colors, our frilly curtains, our pictures of passive pastoral scene and peaceful ambience. They, they, these kinds of things, they say, make men feel more disconnected. That's what they're saying. Some churches attempt to appeal to Masculine sensitivity by changing the decor to something edgier, something darker, something more robust, something less nurturing to see. Maybe men will feel attracted to something like this. Another explanation why 
Uh, there are so few men in the church. It has to do with the stereo stereotypical masculine ego. Men are naturally self-reliant, headstrong, and proud. And so the theory goes, uh, uh, therefore, that, that, that um, they are naturally more resistant to the, to the divine call to humility and submission. And so the gospel confronts our needs, and men are often adverse to admitting neediness. Another one is that most men are reared uh, by fathers who did not attend uh, church services, so very little role model. And so because um, they grew up, fathers did not attend church, they themselves feel like church is a, it's a woman thing. You take the children and you bring them there until they get to age 15, 18, 21, and then from there they can join me to watch the Raptors in the playoff or the Steelers or, 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 or the, the Maple Leaf or the Jays or whoever. The reality is that we have a challenge. We have an issue. We have an issue when it comes to men in the church. And it is something that is so vital and so necessary for us to come to that realization. We do have an issue. A Barna research poll says that uh, you have 1.6 women per man in the church on average. From the Baptist press, he said, did you know that if a child is, is the first person in the household to come to Christ, there is a 3.5% chance that the others will follow. Now, if mom is the first person to become a Christian, there is a 17% probability of everyone in the household following. Now, here is something here, but if the father is the first, there is a 93% probability that everyone else in the household will follow. What's the message there? If you reach men, you reach families. But how do we go about something like that? Of the 94 million men in the United States, according to Woodruff, he says 68 million do not attend any church. 68 million out of that 94. But 85% of those that those um, say they did not grow up with some sort of, uh, or they said they grew up with some sort of church background, 85% of that crowd. These men are not necessarily opposed to church. They just don't see churches as being men-friendly. Churches, by large, are doing a great job, they say, with the women's ministry. According to Woodruff, again, he said, in some ways, it's easier to arrange that than men's ministry because women naturally tend to enjoy getting together and talking to each other. That's what they say. Women like to do that. Men don't necessarily think about that. In fact, they tend to isolate themselves. We need to find a way to get men talking to each other and forming relationships around topics and activities that interest them. There need to be a deliberate 
conscious effort to turn the tide within the church. Some churches have gone to the point of uh, uh, where they've, and this is according to David Morrow, where they've nicked many of the so-called feminine cultural elements uh, ingrained in the traditional church. Things like <laughs> church group hugs, the hand-holding part of things, the emotional displays, they're saying here, and the kind of prayer share and different things like that. And they've moved, removed the banners, the quilt, the curtains, the dollies, the flowers from their worship space. And some of them have even zapped, this is his word here, some of the songs that the sort of Jesus is my boyfriend songs that they've been singing. In other words, it's a sort of lovey-dovey kind of a thing that we present in our worship setting where it's like Jesus hold me, Jesus hug me, Jesus this and all of that. Some women can, you know, they're, they're comfortable with that. Am I making sense here? Am I making sense here? But some men don't do very well with that. And sometimes our churches kind of take that. Am I making any sense here? I am not saying this is the solution. These are just some little practical things to to keep in mind within a church setting. One suggestion, they said, even from a woman's standpoint, what can they do as far as the woman? And that includes children's ministry. Here is another challenge we have today. There, once upon a time, men were steady, consistent teachers within the public school setting, including the uh, especially elementary uh, school. Today you can go through elementary school and have eight teachers from our, our eight to ten teachers from junior kindergarten to the end of grade eight. And you will find that for many young people, you'll say to them, how many, and sometimes I'll ask kids and I'll say to them, how many women teachers, uh, how many men teachers can you recall having? And they would pause for a while. Uh, And then I would say, how many women? They said, pretty much everybody. And so what is happening now is that we start education in such a way that education becomes something, especially in the early stage where retention is so vital. We see so many ladies there, and sometimes our analogies and focus and things like that tend to take on a sort of, uh, you know, a, a experience and, a, a, and, and, and examples because not many people, I mean, if you are... A female, you teach like one. You teach according to your experiences. You teach according to your thinking. Sometimes it's very difficult to, to, to flex and to get out of the box. But what they're saying here is when we deal with that, whether at the church level... Or at the, um, how many men do we have in the children's church? So the challenge we have here is how do we pass on uh, values that are going to impact our children and to keep them, especially in a world that the world that we're dealing with today. How do we keep our kids, keep them manly? How do we get them to understand the, the privilege and the responsibilities that comes with that? Ask any kid today, and the first thing they would say, my mom and then my dad. Now, when, we, when, when, when I was growing up as a kid, it's almost natural where you say, my dad and my mom. Because you understand, to, a, to an extent, culturally, uh, the role. Am, am I making sense? Just work with me here for a, for a moment. 
But in this day and age, what you're seeing here is that sentimentalism has absorbed our culture to the point that it is very difficult to establish leadership. We get bruised, we get hurt, we face challenges so much, and our culture continuously send out this kind of, uh, this sort of siren that you, you've been bruised and hurt, and different things like that. And these are the challenges that you're facing when it comes to establishing a structure that will endure, and structure that will have dynamic impact, and a structure that will have cultural transformation. It is vital and it is very necessary that we come to the realization and understand that your job is not to develop a Mr. Dress-Up system or a Barney system or anything like that. We need to rise up and to recognize and the Christian culture is probably uh, one of, uh, uh, is a culture where people never grow up. Or the, or let's move away from the Christian culture, the Western culture. People just never grow up. You can be 30, 40, and still sit in there and be comforted by video games. You can be 30 and still don't know how to make up your bed. You can be 25 and don't know how to use a basic knife and fork. You can be 30 and don't even know how to dress for an occasion, an interview. You can be 30 and you don't even know the basics of relational management. If this is not addressed, then the challenge we face is that this ship will never turn around. This ship will continue on its downward climb. If we're looking at 39% today, as far as the average, give us five years from now, we'll be looking at 25%. One of the challenges we have because we did not address it in the public school system is that today in many schools, many universities, you have uh, something near uh, anywhere between uh, 60, 40, 70, 30, and even some cases 75, 25, and 80, 20 as far as male and female population in universities. Because we did not address it at that level, and many of them feel education is a girly thing. What about here at our church? What can a woman do about these things? So, what can you, as a woman, or even a single woman, do about this? If you're at home, or let's get to the church setting here. If you volunteer in Sunday school or youth ministry, speak up for boy-friendly curriculum. Am I making sense here? Activities and lessons that, are, that can impact males in your group. Don't make your boys do things that embarrass them. If you notice the girls are outperforming the boys, then change the activity so you can have things that they can relate to. Use um, a balanced enough system that will bring across uh, dynamic, um, you know, males along with females, uh, but use it in such a way that you can communicate to individuals like that. You ca it's not the same stroke for every folks, but it's a matter of making adjustments to be able to be effective in reaching males. If you want to influence the direction of your church, get organized. Uh, back to it's continuing, ladies. Meet with your, some of your lady friends regularly 
and pray for the men in your lives and those in your congregation because prayer is powerful. It has to be deliberate, especially when two or three agree touching anything. But it starts with the understanding or the realization that we have a problem. It's where we call Houston and we say, Houston, there is a problem. And if we come and face it head on and look for appropriate solutions, we can turn this thing around. Am I making sense here? But that's the reality of what we're dealing with here. We have basically taken the approach, and if we're going to turn this around, we're going to have to look and be willing to see the issue, confront the issue, and see how we can turn this thing around. Come on, a little amen or something. We will have to get to a place where we will have to acknowledge men. We will have to bless men. We will have to pray with men. We will have to challenge men. And we will also need to point men to the ultimate father himself, God Almighty, and turn this ship around. It is necessary for us to man up. And I noticed someone put there, are you committed to merge that with what was said earlier? I think that's a good idea there. Thank you so much for that. We will have to man up. We will have to be deliberate to recognize that there must be a season of man time. We have to recall, re, re, uh, recognize the, the need to, to, to have a roll call for men where we're deliberate in our approach to seek to reach men for Christ. We will need to go and rally, motivate, mobilize men to stand up, to take your place, and to embrace the divine calling of Almighty God on your life. And the day you take that, that, that stand, and the day you rise up and take responsibility, you will see God Almighty starting to work wondrously in your life. We can change this thing. Amen. Miracles comes in can. I can do all things through Christ. As we start to go out there and start to believe that we've been called and we can make a difference, then all of a sudden, miracles will become a reality. And we need to acknowledge it, and we also need to embrace it. And to say, look, God has brought us for such a time as this, in this time, in this generation. His anointing is upon us to turn the tide, to turn the ship around, and to see an influx of the power of God, or the power of God being at work, and to cause an influx of men to come into this place. You bring men and you'll bring families. You bring men in this place and there will be structure. You bring men and there will be order. You bring men and there will be a turning around. You bring men and there will be le less violence in the home, less violence on the street, less addiction on drugs and alcohol and pornography and different things like that because men are coming in and they're taking a role. They're, they're coming before God and they're being broken and God is doing a work in their lives and that will make a difference. My life was, there have been wonderful ladies in the church and I thank God for them. Sometimes I've gotten cases where I was adopted where people would just look at you and you say you're my son and things like that. And I thank God for those um, mother figures in my own life. 
But what really changed my perspective, my outlook, and at the same time to push me towards responsibility is my interaction with men who would challenge me in the area of prayer. I had men who, who could pray, and thank God I ended up in groups like that. I did not end up with the, the sort of uh, the people who are just standing there on the side. You know, the people, you, you remember the three types of people you have in the church? The inner circle, mid-circle, and outer circle. Now the outer circle are the people who are, uh, who, who are, wonder, who are watching what's happening. And then the mid-circle are the people who are wondering what's happening. And then the inner circle are the ones who are making things happen. Now, I ended up in that group of people who were making things happen. I did not know how to pray. I had some amount of desire in me, but carnality was over me more than ever. I did not know how to pray beyond two minutes or so. But what? I ended up in a setting and then I was forced to because I had people who could pray. Now, I had the best intercessor in the church of maybe a couple thousand or so people. I had the best intercessor and he just came over to me and then he, he, started, he just liked me and he started hanging out with me. And then I had probably the best soul winner in terms of one-on-one -on -one evangelism. And then he also was a friend of that person. And so he started coming to my house. Initially, I didn't like it. But God opened the door where his life, now recently I was speaking to this professor somewhere, and, um, and he was out of Sri Lanka, and I, I, I said to him, where were you? He said, oh, I, went, I, I didn't see you. For, he said, I, I went away for a while. I went to go start an institution that they started there, and I went to go manage it. I was the president for it for a while. And I said, so you're back now? He said, yeah, what course are you teaching? I said, uh, we, we talked for a while, and then afterwards I said, I said, funny enough, I was supposed to go to Sri Lanka one day and, uh, to carry out certain things. And I said, I have a friend by the name of Tony. And then he said, Tony. I said, yeah. He said, I know Tony. He said, Tony was used of God in, in such a way. But all it started, it started because Tony developed a prayer life. And he was consistent with it. And through that, God was able to open doors for him. We learned how to pray there. Then time come now. They said, well, we're going to have all night prayer meeting. I'm like, all night. You mean we start to pray and then we stop. Yep, when the sun comes up. Then you realize that as you... Then after a while, it became something... That was not difficult. But you start from a place where you could not pray any at all. How do you get to a level like that? It has to be a deliberate effort. And nothing will come easy. And men, if you're going to go forward in the things of God. Thank you for joining us at The Rock where the men of valor at Solid Rock are bold and brave builders, not only in the kingdom, but in their families and the community. We invite you to join us on Sundays for our worship service. You can visit our website for more information or find more sermons on our YouTube channel. We look forward to seeing you again at The Rock. Solid Rock welcomes you.